Okay, this is part two of chapter four for Anderson's Environmental Economics. And we start with uh, modern problems with private solutions. Now, the Coase theorem is nice, but um, there are lots of, lots of issues with uh, truly applying the Coase theorem. If you remember from the previous chapter, the Coase theorem was the idea that private negotiations can lead to efficient outcomes if property rights are clearly, de clearly defined and the affected party can bargain with few or no transactions costs. Or as I say in my classes, the Coase theorem is nice as long as you know who is doing the action and what the action is. In the real world, there are lots of times when you don't know necessarily those things and you don't have true private property rights. Some of the issues that your book refers to are, there could be multiple sources of the externality. Uh, it's you know, difficult to bargain with multiple, multiple sources, as well, uh, especially if you don't know who those sources are. There could be multiple victims. You don't necessarily know everybody who's being impacted by the, um, the external action. Pollution would be an exa a great example of this. Incomplete information. You don't know exactly what is what it is that's that's happening. Um, this could this this could be like uh, like an impact from cancer or impact from um, from smoking. You don't exactly know either what it is or how it's affecting you. There could be a strategic be behavior um, involving aggressive attempts to gain larger portions of the benefit from negotiations. So there could be an issue of the um, uh, of the parties um, trying to get an edge on each other. Uh, other things could be uh, time lags uh, um, between the cause and the effect of, ex of the externality, making it difficult to identify the externality and its source. Uh, let's see. Um, there's other things here: transactions, costs, social uh, mores. There's just lots of things that can make the, the true enactment of the Coase Theorem uh, difficult to do in, in real life. And this section, end, this section ends with the question, would you really want to negotiate or even bribe your neighbor? He has a very nice section um, about, about um, the unsightly house across the street. But the question being, do the complainers ever knock on their neighbor's door with an offer of $1,000 to exchange for less neon color of the house paint? Or do they negotiate? And yeah, he has a good point here because yeah, people oftentimes don't tend to negotiate. They, they may be adverse to getting in the face of their unsightly neighbor. They may be afraid of a fight and they may be afraid of retaliation. So government or that third party is called to um, address the grievances. Um, your author text talks a little bit about the residence hall example, and they may go to a third party, go to a resident advisor or a government representative. There you go, that's the government who is hopefully going to solve the problem. And uh, in a lot of businesses or even the agency even higher education uh, we we don't necessarily um, discuss with each other or try to alleviate grievances with each other we always have a third party coming in coming into play and that is definitely the role of the government okay so as we continue in this chapter now we have a situation um, that again was referred to in the previous chapter and this is the tragedy of the commons. Now in this case we have the example of tea farmers and it's a commonly owned tea plantation and in this case there are no property rights. Nobody owns the tea plantation. And if a tea picker is not going to harvest in this area again then the incentive is to harvest as much as they possibly can. And that is the same with all the other team pickers. 
and thus we get resource depletion because there are no property rights. This is the issue of the tragedy of the commons because no one owns the property itself. Um, there is no incentive to, um, to uphold the property for the, um, um, there's no individual incentive. Okay. And now we go to a situation where there are indeed property rights. Now, each tea picker owns a particular patch. Their harvest behavior is internalized. So they are going to take into consideration the social cost because they own part of the resource. So as you can see here, each individual tea, um, tea picker owns a portion of the tea plant and so they are going, they're they're going to be mindful because they want to reharvest the plant in the next year, or the next period of time. The, so to overpick the, a plant is to decrease the value of indeed that privately held resource. And um, this is oftentimes strat the strategy of organizations like the Nature Conservancy. They are a nonprofit group that holds lands uh, in perpetuity um, to keep it away from rapacious development. But they, the key is they themselves own the land. It is not openly uh, accessed and available. Okay, and this leads to this interesting story that your um, author has, where the buffalo roamed and private property rights. And the point your author is making is that property rights can and do change behavior. Few people would treat their own property the way they treat open access areas. And that was definitely shown in the 19th century in the case of wild buffalo. Millions of wild buffalo were slaughtered on open access areas, sometimes from the cabs of transcontinental railroad cars. Now this not only decimated the wild buffalo herd, it also decimated the livelihood of Native Americans who did not believe or even know about this idea of private, private property rights. They just had a they just had a sense of buffalo were our resource. We would um, um, we would kill only what we needed, and um, and then be mindful of the future. Uh, unfortunately, um, Western Americans uh, did not ascribe to this point of view. Now, um, your example continues as the land became parceled out. Um, your um, talks about land west of the Mississippi with the Homestead Act of 1862. As the land became parceled out by the U.S. government, owners became more vested in the treatment of the land, and the population of the buffalo be um, themselves increased as well. Okay, I'm going to end things here for this section.